To teach something effectively, you have to think about what is going on inside the student's head and what you want to be going on inside the student's head. So we have to talk about those things first before we get into these specific tips and techniques. I think there are basically four kinds of things that we should care about if we're interested in teaching a kid basic math. The first is conceptual knowledge. So what do they know about how numbers work, about how addition and subtraction works, and what do we want them to know? The second is procedural knowledge. So what strategies do they use to solve addition and subtraction problems, and how can we make those strategies more sophisticated? The third category is associations. So what does the kid associate math with? What do they associate addition and subtraction with? The fourth category is attitudes and behaviors. What kinds of attitudes and behaviors when it comes to solving problems do we want to help kids to develop? Let's start with conceptual goals. Before you teach your kid addition and subtraction, they probably already have some experience with numbers. They probably have done some counting. They probably have some sense of number magnitude. You know, they might know 100 is, is bigger than 50 or bigger than 10. And they may have begun to do what's called subitizing, which is when you look at a bunch of items and you just automatically know how many there are without counting. So like three, if I gave you three items, you don't have to count one, two, three, you just see it and you know that it's three. From this starting point, what conceptual goals do we have? One major goal is to teach them the appropriate situations to apply addition and subtraction. Addition is associated with combining, putting together, continuing, going forward, right? It's the total number of things. It's how much we walked today all together, adding everything up. Subtraction is associated with differences, taking away debts or things that are owed, a going backwards or reversing. How much taller is this building than that building? Addition makes things bigger. Subtraction makes things smaller. We're still thinking in the positive number world at this point. Another key idea is the reversibility of addition and subtraction. So if you take a number and you add five and then you subtract five, you get back to your original number. And that's true no matter how many things you are adding and subtracting. Basic addition and subtraction also forms these number triplets. If you take two numbers and you add them together, then you take that sum and you subtract one of those numbers from it, you get back the original number. We also want to help them develop a sense of number magnitude. It's not just that we want them to be able to count up or count down or to apply an algorithm to get the answer to a two-digit addition problem. It's that they have some rough sense of how much the answer is going to be. There is also a key conceptual tool that helps students to think about addition and subtraction, and that is the number line. There's a fair amount of research that experience with number lines helps students to develop key mathematical skills. So that was conceptual knowledge. Let's move on to procedural knowledge. There are different strategies that students used to solve addition and subtraction problems. Here are three. You can use your hands to count up or down. You can use uh, manipulatives to put things together or take things away. And you can also break numbers up and look for shortcuts to make the addition or subtraction problem easier. These strategies are linked to conceptual understanding and number sense. So if you add by 10 or 20 or 30, you don't have to pay attention to the ones place, right? And understanding that a, a number that ends in zero is only affecting the tens place or above is critical in, in being able to actually apply the strategy in the first place. And so you can get them to use the strategy and that helps them understand the concept. You can teach the concept and that can help them understand the strategy. It's important to keep in mind that strategy changes are not discrete. You might think, oh, hey, they started using this more sophisticated strategy and it's just better than the old strategy. Why aren't they using this new strategy all the time? Well, that's not how strategic change works. Usually you find a new strategy and you're still using the old strategies and you're kind of using a mixture of strategies together to help you solve the problem. And over time, the trend is to use more and more sophisticated strategies. On to associations. What adjectives would you like your kid to associate with math? Fun, boring, engaging, nerve wracking, interesting, rewarding, useful. The association that your kid makes now is going to influence how they think about math and how they learn math in the future. And ideally, we want to observe our kids to see 
what their feelings are about math, and we'd like to promote more positive and more accurate associations about math and what it can do for you. The last thing I want to talk about is dispositions and behaviors. You want to encourage persistence in problem solving. You want to discourage guessing behavior, which is where the kid is just like, I don't know, is it five? Is it 10? Is it 13? Is it 22? That kind of behavior where they're not really engaging in the problem at all. You want to encourage the kid to rely on their own thinking. You want to encourage them to find ways of checking their answer or to use multiple different solution methods. So with all that in mind, here are some approaches that I have personally tried to try to pursue these goals that I've talked about already. Kids don't have long attention spans and I don't want my son to associate math with drudgery. So I try to keep sessions pretty short, like 15 minutes max for a five-year-old, maybe a little bit longer if they're into it. I also remove as many distractions as possible. So I might have some toys or games that can help us think mathematically, but everything else I get rid of. There's no other random toys, there's no snacks, there's no drinks, there's no tempting screens or anything like that. Or you, know, you could just move to an environment that already is kind of clean, which is where you do math. To help deepen their understanding of what addition and subtraction means, I try to pick examples that my son is already familiar with, and I try to use a variety of examples. We might use blocks to add or subtract, or planes to add or subtract, or talk about chopsticks adding or subtracting. You want to use a lot of different concrete examples in different contexts. And as they get comfortable with these concrete examples, you want to move between abstract representations of the problem and concrete examples of the problem. This helps them to see what the generalization of the problem is in the abstract representation, but it also helps them to see how you actually apply this abstract idea in various scenarios. To facilitate more sophisticated strategy use, what I like to do is to model my own thinking. So I think aloud as I'm answering a question. For instance, I might ask a question like, how do we get to the 10th floor from the sixth floor? How many floors do we have to go up? Maybe they don't quite understand how to answer this question. So what I might say is something like, okay, one way to think about it is to count up. So we're on the sixth floor. So I'm gonna go up one floor, we'll be on seven. I'm gonna go up two floors, we'll be on eight. I'm gonna go up three floors, we'll be on nine. I'm gonna go four floors, we're gonna be on 10. Yeah, 10, okay. So how many floors did we go up? Oh, we went up four floors. Now in essence, this is a subtraction problem, but like I said, asking different kinds of subtraction and addition problems helps them to develop a deeper conceptual understanding of what addition and subtraction mean. Let me just give you a couple of other examples to show you what I mean. You ran four miles and then you stopped for a snack. I want to catch up to you and I, I've run one mile already. How many more miles do I have to run before I see you? The tallest building in the neighborhood is 13 floors. Now our building is only seven floors. So how much taller is the tallest building than our building? As adults, I think it's very easy for us to jump in too quickly when we are working on math problems. Because it's very obvious to us what the right answer is and where the kid is going wrong. But this disrupts the problem solving process. It doesn't give them a chance to fully try to solve the problem on their own. So I tend to give my son some time just to think about the problem before I jump in with all kinds of answers and explanations and blah, blah, blah. Sometimes he goes under a blanket to think, that's like his thinking space, or other times he'll go hide like in a closet and then he'll, he'll come out and he'll announce his answer. And that makes it a little more fun. To encourage answer checking behaviors every once in a while, I will say, oh, like, are you sure? I almost always do this if he made a mistake, but a lot of times I will do it even if he got the answer right, because I don't want him to know that he got the answer wrong every time that I just say, are you sure? And then after I ask them this, I try to get them to either double check or explain to me how they got that answer and make an argument for their answer. I think it's a, an overall good idea to think in terms of reasoning and in terms of arguments. So like, well, what is your reason for coming up with that answer? Is it a good reason or is it a bad reason? To keep the session fun and interesting and to model more sophisticated problem solving strategies, you can ask your kid to give you a problem and model how to answer it. A lot of times kids are in the position of 
always being told what to do or always being the, the one who has to answer the question. By having them ask you questions sometimes, it gives a more collaborative back and forth feel. When my son does this, he tries to give me a really hard problem or something that he thinks is really hard, but usually turns out to be pretty easy. Something like, what's one million plus one million? If he asked me this question, I might say something like, well, what if you had a dog and I have a dog? How many dogs do we have together? And he would say, well, two naturally. And it's like, okay, well, I have a million and you have a million. How many millions do we have together? Then the answer becomes pretty obvious. As you are modeling answers, you can also make mistakes every once in a while. So this encourages the kid to kind of watch you. They can't fully trust that you always are thinking through the answer correctly. And it gives you an opportunity to model the kind of behavior that you want them to have when they make mistakes. For instance, I might be answering a question like 14 minus three and say, hmm, 14 minus three. Oh, well, that's 12. If your kid is monitoring you a little bit, they can say, no, 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 that's wrong. And you say, oh, wait, wait, why is it wrong? Can you show me why it's wrong? And then they might show you something like, well, if you start from 14 and you go down by one, that's 13 and two, that's 12 and three, that gets to 11. So the answer is 11. And then I might say something like, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. You could also ask them to develop another argument. Are you sure? Like, is there another way that you could know that 14 minus three is not 12? Another way you could know is that you're starting off with an even number and you're subtracting an odd number. And if you subtract an odd number from an even number, you can't get an even number like 12. Sometimes if I'm teaching my son something new or a new way of solving a problem, I will frame it as a secret. So I'll, I'll go to like a little uh, a corner, I'll whisper to him, or maybe we'll, we'll go under a blanket and, and try to hide from other people and, and talk about this cool new secret. Now, this has the benefit of making the new technique or the new strategy seem cool, but then it also kind of sets you up for this expectation that everything has to be a secret, which then I had to kind of uh, deal with later on. So I don't know 100% if that's a good thing to do, but uh, it's something that I have done on occasion. For number lines, you want to think about creative ways of incorporating number lines, especially leveraging what your kid already knows. So we live in an apartment building. He's super familiar with elevators. And so we just use the elevator, which actually goes into the basement. So those, those, are, those are the B numbers, the negative numbers, it goes into the basement as a number line when we are thinking about problems sometimes. And you can try to figure out, well, for your family and your situation, what's a good analog? to a number line that your kid could be familiar with. And then you can use different kinds of analogs as they uh, develop their reasoning skills. Finally, to facilitate some number sense, I sometimes ask them to estimate an answer. And the way I might do that is like, okay, 22 plus 31. Is 22 plus 31 bigger than 100 or smaller than 100? This is an easy version of that question because I've pinned it to another number and I'm asking them to compare these two numbers, the sum of 22 plus 31 versus 100. And the gap between 100 and 53 is pretty large. Now, so you can, you can bring that gap closer and closer as they get better at estimating numbers. And you can also ask the question without a reference number like 100. So you can say, well, 22 plus 31, about how much do you think it is? And hopefully, eventually they get to the point where they are saying something like, well, I think it's about 50 something. Maybe they don't know that it's exactly 53. Okay, so that's the end of my tips. And I realize this has just been a grab bag of different strategies and advice and ideas. But I hope that it has got you thinking about what we should be trying to develop when we teach kids basic math. But maybe it's got you thinking about other cool stuff that you can do that I haven't really even talked about. I'd love to hear your thoughts on teaching basic math to kids in the comments below. And I have a bunch of references and a couple of links to resources in the description, including a link to one of my favorite games for teaching kids basic math. Okay, that's it. Good luck. Have fun. And I'll see you next time.